Well, it looks like there's even a, a few new disclaimers or at least one more. I never saw the one for live streaming before. Yeah, I hadn't either. <laughs> so, and it is now, it looks like above your head. <laughs> So, okay, well, it's eight o'clock according to my computer. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tracy Irby, and I am the director at Texas Women's University Center for Women Entrepreneurs. Uh, so nice to see so many of you this morning and hope you are able to take advantage of the networking. Uh, it's always great to learn what everybody is doing. Uh, we have with us this morning, Donna Lisa Stinyard. She is our program director. Uh, I know Justina Shaw is also here as well. She is our small business advisor. Uh, and we have Samantha over on Facebook. So again, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. The Center for Women Entrepreneurs was funded in 2015 by the state legislature just to help promote women entrepreneurs anywhere in the state of Texas. And they thought, what better place to put that than at Texas Women's University? So we assist women through small business advising, funding, networking and training events like this in research uh, into women in business, women entrepreneurs. We are a part of the larger Jane Nelson Institute for Women's Leadership. The Institute is dedicated to preparing women to take on successful roles in business and public service to ensure women have the education to establish careers as successful C-suite executives, the skills for building entrepreneurial businesses, and the framework needed to run for public office. The other centers besides ours are, is the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy and the Center for Student Leadership. So again, we're excited to have uh, all of you here today, and I will go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, so Lisa Locke and Wendy Lear, Lear, is that correct? I'm sorry, Wendy. That is correct. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they have over 25 years experience in human resource and, and payroll. In 2017, they joined together to form Human Resource Solutions LLC with a focus on helping small businesses. Their expertise in employee benefits, payroll, employee relations, policy development, and compliance. So we're so happy to have both of you here this morning. Uh, and for everyone, if there are questions, you can put those in the chat below. And ladies, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Tracy. We are so excited to be here today and present to all of you. And uh, today we want to share some information on we're going to, you know, human resource blueprint for small businesses. So if you have a small business or you're thinking about starting one, we want to provide some information for you today to hopefully things you can put into place prior to bringing on your new uh, first employee. So let's just get started. All right, next screen, please. All right, so some of the things we're gonna cover today is the full life cycle of an employee. So hiring employees, the employment uh, portion, employee relations, workplace safety, and then how to exit your employees. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is hiring employees. So the first thing you want to think about when you want to bring on new employees is you need to put together a job description. So what does that job description need to include? So you want to include your essential functions of that position, the position summary, the main responsibilities for that position, what experience are they going to need for that position, what type of education are they going to need for that position, also, if they need computer skills, you're going to want to list that as well. And then what type of environment are they going to be working in? An office environment, uh, outdoors, um, a warehouse, you need to list that in your job description as well. Also, this job description can be used for your recruiting ads. So 
That's why you want to put as much information in that job description as possible. The next thing you want to do when uh, deciding on your new position is you want to determine what compensation you're going to pay. So right now, many states are increasing their minimum wage higher than the federal minimum wage. So currently, Texas is at $7.25 per hour, which is the same as the federal minimum wage. But you want to pay what that position is worth. Don't pay what the candidate was making in their last position. You want to look at that position specifically and pay what it is worth. If you're not sure what that position is worth, you can always look at salary survey data. There's many things out there that you can look for that can provide information on that position. All right, next slide. All right, so Another thing you wanna think about is being very competitive. So right now, everyone is hiring. If everywhere you go, you see a now hiring sign. So a lot of things that people are looking for when they're looking for a job is they're wanting companies that offer possibly a flexible work schedule and now even more than ever, remote work if possible, learning opportunities, competitive benefits, um, employee appreciation days, such as it could be simple things like bringing in lunch once a week for, for everyone on the team or taking everyone out for a team building event, such as bowling or, you know, so, uh, some fun activity. Also, people are looking for a balance between their work life and their personal life. So where do you start when you're trying to find candidates? So, you know, there's there's many things you can look at. You can look, reach out to your local high school counselors, um, the vocational teachers, even colleges. Um, social media is a great place. Even employee and your friend referrals. I know a lot of companies um, pay re, uh, referral fees if someone in the company uh, has a referral that they bring on and stays for at least six months or to a year. Also, job posting sites. There's lots of job posting sites out there. So you just wanna get the word out and let everyone know you, that you are hiring. So what are some good job posting sites to post your position on? So. Some popular ones are Indeed, LinkedIn, Glassdoor, um, Career Builder. There's also a lot of specialized job posting sites that are for your particular industry. So I know with the restaurant industry, there's a site out there called Poach. Um, that's where you can post your jobs. You can look for people to hire. So just you know, look out there for your particular industry and see what's, what's offered. All right, then the next thing you wanna think about is your employment applications. So you wanna make sure that the employee completes that employment application prior to their first interview. Um, you wanna provide, or they want to, they can provide information that you won't necessarily see on their resume. And then don't make that application so long, like four pages long, keep it, you know, one to two pages is typically all you need. And then when an employee is filling out the application, they're signing off that that information is true and accurate as well, that you don't get on the resume. Also on the employment application, there's certain things you don't wanna ask for. For example, do not ask for their social security number. You don't need it at that point. Their date of birth that gives their age. A date of school or college graduation. Again, that can tell possibly their age. Um, you don't want to ask for, you know, what type of clubs or outside activities they participate in. If it doesn't relate to the position, you don't need to ask. Um, don't want to ask questions about past compensation. You know, a lot of states are banning uh, right now um, 
asking for past compensation. It's against the law. I know Texas currently does not have that law, but it's just a good idea not to ask that information. Again, you want to pay what position is worth, not what they were making at their previous. Okay. All right, next slide. All right, the next Wendy, you are having some trouble hearing you. Lisa, is this something you could take over? Um, yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, all right. Yeah, it sounds like maybe there's some, some technical difficulties. <laughs> um, okay, yes. I, I'll You're muted, Lisa. How about now? Yep. Okay, great. All right. Um, jumping in here, just thinking about the types of questions you want to ask um, as you interview candidates. You want to ask type of what we call behavioral type questions, which is going to give you information, you know, about their work history, their experience. It gives you a more complete understanding. For example, ask them, you know, what did they do in their last position? Um, explain their day-to-day -day duties, explain how um, they manage their time. And then you, situational questions are always good because a situational question is like, okay, if you're looking for a receptionist position, then maybe in that position, you would say, um, okay, you're a receptionist and you have an irate client come in. How would you handle that position? How do you handle that different those different situations. And that way you can really understand more of their thought process and how they would handle those situations and it would it, would it work for your environment. Uh, the main thing is to avoid yes, no questions. Um, I can tell you, you know, just from interviewing candidates, it could be a short interview if all you're getting is a yes or no. If you're not really digging in deeper and the client, I mean, the candidate's only responding back to this yes or no. So sometimes it is difficult to get that information out of them, but try to figure out those questions and, and maybe even have those questions ready before you interview the candidate. Okay, we're trying to change the slide. <laughs> Okay, here we go, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so just in, in general, some questions to not ask. Just be sure that when you're interviewing candidates, you're asking appropriate questions that are job related. Uh, you don't need to ask questions such as um, where they uh, live, what holidays do they celebrate? Um, you know, do they have any type of disabilities? Have they been out on workers' comp? Focus mainly on what is required for that job. Make, make sure your questions focus on the job and what is needed in that position. Once you've made your decision on a candidate, then always provide an offer letter explaining, you know, what is the start date? What is the salary? Uh, you want to make sure you provide a written offer letter uh, because that's gonna be your backup. That's gonna be what you have in your agreement and have that candidate sign off on the offer letter. Uh, we have talked to some clients and they just do the verbal offers and then comes back and there's some type of difference maybe in the salary and there's nothing there to prove what that conversation was. So make sure that you have it in writing. Um, within the offer letter, you do want to include the, the employment at will language, which basically states that in the state of Texas, you can terminate an employee at any time or they can leave your employment at any time. Um, so you have that flexibility there. Um, you want to also, you know, make sure you're including that salary rate. Ideally, you include it on however your pay cycles are, such as an hourly basis, a biweekly basis, um, semi-monthly. 
One word of caution is just not to include an annual rate uh, because sometimes that could be considered a contract that you're going to be paying that person and keeping them for a, for a year basis. And then make the offer contingent on background checks. Um, if you handle any background checks, then you wanna make sure that, that all that's completed before that candidate starts work. Uh, some things to think about in a background check, uh, things that you might want to consider checking would be past employment to verify the dates of employment. Uh, if it's a driving position, then you need to check on the driving. You wanna make sure that that person or that candidate does not have any uh, serious driving problems like a DWI or something. Uh, criminals important in positions, especially if you have uh, employees going into someone's home or maybe you're working with children a uh, criminal is, a, is something that really needs to be checked. Uh, credit is often checked if it's a position working in a financial situation, somebody dealing with money. And then references and drug screenings are also other things that you may want to include on background checks. Uh, we would recommend if you do a background check for your uh, new employees to use a firm to do that because they can they, they know more of the processes and procedures and they can reduce your liability. Um, if you are pulling information yourself, you may not have that ability to pull all of the information. So a, a reputable background screen firm would be the best way to go for that. Um, once you have your new employee starting, you want to make sure you have certain types of documents for that employee uh, because it is, if you have these basic documents, it's going to save you a lot of time down the road, uh, prevent maybe any um, differences or questions about salaries, for example, or confidentiality. Um, you want to have that employment application, uh, again, because Wendy, as she mentioned, uh, it's going to have information that you may not have on a resume. And also it has on an employment application, you're always saying, having that person sign off, verifying that the information on that application is correct. So down the road, if you find something that may not be correct or misstated on uh, the application, you have that backup to say, well, you signed off and said it, that this was correct information. So you want to have the employment application, the offer letter, a confidentiality agreement. Uh, typically in companies, if you're, for example, maybe in a, a plumbing type of company, you don't want that person to leave and then possibly take all of your information, your client list, for example. So you'd like to have some type of confidentiality agreement. I'm um, in the state of Texas for you to be able to deduct any type of um, deductions from an employee's paycheck, you need a wage deduction agreement uh, that the employee signs off on saying that, yes, it's okay for you to make these deductions from my check. Um, that doesn't include taxes, et cetera, but it would include things like if you're requiring an employee to um, um, have worked with certain materials and maybe something needs to be repaired, you might, if you charge them for anything like that, you could have, you need to have a wage deduction agreement. Um, emergency contact information is helpful, a handbook acknowledgement. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. And then direct deposit forms, a W-4, and then an I-9 eligibility form. Um, in the state of Texas, it also requires any company to report new hires and rehires within 20 days from their starting date. And so that is information that has to be reported to the state. And if you're doing your payroll, maybe if you're doing the payroll yourself, starting off um, doing QuickBooks or something, then you may be responsible for reporting that. Uh, they probably have something set up in QuickBooks to allow that to make it easy process. Um, or the payroll provider that you're using would handle that. And then we also have the I-9 that is required. And uh, this probably in the last few years, it's been out in the news a little bit more because of um, companies not checking or not requiring an I-9, but it is a requirement. Um, and it requires employees to hire only individuals who can legally work in the United States. Um, as an employer, you should read those instructions on the I-9 form to really understand what is required, what you can ask for, and what are the required time, time frames to get that information. Uh, because there are certain documents that you can ask for, and you want to make sure that you understand that and you're not asking for something that's outside of the list. And then you should always keep that I-9 paperwork separate from an employee file. 
So you would want to have a separate file for your I-9s. And then just in general, once you have that employee hired and ready for them to start on the first day, you know, make them feel welcome, make them, uh, you know, feel welcome by offering, you know, maybe you have a company logo item or, uh, you know, something as some type of plant, give them a call before the first day, let them know what they, what time to be there and what they should do. Um, often I hear about companies and they have a new hire and they come in and the new employee comes in and they don't even have the computer and nothing ready to start work on their first day. And so sometimes that can just set things off on the bad tone. So make sure that you're prepared to have that new hire come in. Uh, schedule an orientation and walk them through what your expectations are, policies, procedures, show them around the office, and then also make sure they know who they can go to to ask for questions. Uh, next, we're just gonna cover a few things on employment. Now that you have the employee hired, a um, few things that covers on employment, and it would be, the first thing is the type of employee that you have coming into your office or into your business. Uh, the categories typically are going to fall under a non-exempt employee, an exempt, a temporary, or a contract employee. Uh, the main confusion sometimes on a non-exempt and exempt is what are the differences? And the difference as a non-exempt employee is typically paid on an hourly basis. Um, when I say typically, they are paid on an hourly basis. Um, or they can, I'm sorry, they can be paid on a salary, but most times you're going to see them on an hourly basis, but you have to track their time. Their time must be tracked on a timesheet um, or online system. So they would be tracking their time coming in and out for lunch and back in, et cetera. Uh, the reason for that is because they are eligible for overtime. And then you must pay the minimum wage. Um, status is determined by duties and wages. And then the main thing that we, we have come across is that a lot of times companies feel like, well, depending on the job title, that's gonna tell me if that position is exempt or non-exempt. But the key thing there is, is not really, it can vary from company to company. So you really have to look at the duties and the wages of that position to determine is that position gonna be exempt or non-exempt. Um, the exempt, if they are exempt from overtime, uh, they need to fall in one of the Department of Labor categories to qualify. And on the Department of Labor site, they have different categories that you would fall into, uh, an exempt employee could fall into, and that could be something like a professional type position, a sales position. Uh, some of the graphic, uh, marketing graphic designer type positions can, computer type positions, those are really tricky to determine if they're exempt or non-exempt. Uh, so the Department of Labor website has some really good information on how to make those decisions. And as I mentioned, an exempt employee, they do not receive overtime. Uh, they're paid a set salary. There's no hourly minimum wage, but you do have to pay them a minimum weekly wage. And it's also really difficult to dock pay for time off. So um, whereas a non-exempt is paid for the hours worked, an exempt employee in some situations may be paid even if they're not, um, if they're taking time off due to a personal reason or something. It depends on some of your other policies. Uh, you might, may also consider, you know, is this position going to be part-time or will it be full-time? Uh, part-time is typically paid on an hourly basis. And you can have an exempt employee part-time, but it would be paid on a set salary. But um, also if you're offering benefits, you need to check your benefit plans to determine eligibility. If they're full-time and they're non-exempt, they should, you should only pay overtime on hours worked over 40 per week. Uh, one of the clients that we worked with, they were paying overtime on any hours over 37 hours a week uh, because 37 hours was their average work time frame. So they thought after 37 hours, I need to be paying overtime. That could get expensive. So you want to make sure you're only paying hours, um, overtime on hours over 40. That's your requirement. And then if there's any benefits that you offer, those are some things to check when you're determining if somebody's part-time or full-time is how that affects your benefit plans and would they be covered under benefits. 
Uh, another option that a lot of new employers are uh, just starting up may consider is to get help from a temporary agency. And a temporary agency, they are responsible for paying, paying the employee, paying their benefits and their taxes. So it takes that burden off of you. However, you are paying not only the employee's salary, but you pay a certain percentage above that salary because the temporary to that temporary agency uh, because they are going out and finding the candidates for you. Um, you may also have temporary agents, I mean, temporary employees on your company you, payroll. You can hire somebody directly as a temporary employee, but we would just recommend that you make sure it's for a short-term assignment. Uh, you don't want to have a temporary employee on your payroll for six months, for example, because in that time frame, typically that's going to be a true employment position. And that employee could be missing out on benefits offered to regular full-time employees. Um, starting up a business or new companies may often think about interns to fill in and help out with some of the duties needed. And, tip, and temporary employees, that usually is where an intern would fall. Uh, most likely it would be an hourly temporary situation there. So that would be something to consider when you're trying to determine what employees you need for your business. A lot of times companies are considering contract employees. And a contract employee would be somebody that is paid not through your payroll, but on a 1099 basis. Uh, they may have their own business set up. They could have like an LLC a, um, or something set up that you would pay them directly on a 1099 and not through a W-2 situation. Uh, the thing with the contract employees is that it is an area that the IRS is closely looking at and they, they continually look at. Um, as a contract employee, you had to consider, you know, are you setting the hours as, as you, the man manager of the company, are you setting the hours? Are you requiring that employee to be there for a certain time frame? Um, are you actually paying any of their expenses? Are you providing the supplies, the tools? And by chance, are you giving them time off? Are you allowing them to be on any of your benefit plans? So if, if that's the case, then you need to think about, is this really an employee or a contract employee? Uh, because usually they're going to, the IRS would lean towards that's going to be an employee and they should be um, on your payroll. The main, um, one of the main reasons of that is because as a, as a W-2 employee, the IRS, you're paying your, their taxes and also that employee is getting the benefits that somebody doing a light job is, is getting. So that's one area that's always being looked at closely. Um, employee benefits. Uh, starting off in a small business, I know it's really tough to think about benefits and what can you offer new employees. Uh, so there may be some things that you can do. Um, they are an effective way in retaining employees as well as recruiting for new employees. Uh, some things that you could consider would be some time off plans, uh, vacation, sick time, uh, paid time off, PTO. And there may be some benefits that you can offer that would not be um, as, as expensive. Uh, you have basic benefits that are medical, dental, vision, life insurance, uh, disability, and typically a small company would offer a simple IRA. Uh, as a company, you may pick up a portion or all of the cost. And then um, if you are offering benefits, that is another level of compliance you need to think about because all the benefit plans, there are going to be different communication guidelines you need to uh, present to employees, make sure that they're aware of the benefits, you're enrolling them at the proper time, et cetera. And so that's just a whole nother kind of level of compliance and um, things that you would need to think about when you start adding employees to your workforce. A few things we wanted to touch on in the employee relations section. Um, it's going to include the, the main item is an employee handbook uh, for your employee relations. And a lot of times companies think, well, I just have one employee. Do I need an employee handbook? Well, you really should have one. Um, it may not be the full blown employee handbook, but you should have some of the main policies, some of your common procedures, policies in the employee handbook because that is going to be what you're using for your, your communicating your company's culture, communicating the different laws and procedures. And you also have the employee sign off saying, yes, I have read this, I understand it, and I'm agreeing to it. So we would recommend you always have an employee handbook at some, some um, 
level, whether it be just a short, you know, 20 page handbook, or it could be a full blown, we've seen them up to like 60 pages, which, which is a lot. That's a lot, a lot of information for employees. Now, some of the key things in the employee handbook that we're going to focus on are the policies that you really need to have in there to protect your company. And you want to have a, a um, information about discrimination that your company does not discriminate. These are the reasons, um, types of discrimination that may occur, but you wanna make sure that this information is in your employee handbook so that everybody understands that you do not discriminate and others should not discriminate uh, based on any of these factors, such as you know, race, color, religion, disability, um, age, et cetera. So this is a policy that you really do need to have in that employee handbook. And the other big issues in an employee handbook deal with um, harassment, the different types of harassment. Uh, you have regular harassment, sexual harassment, and bullying would be some of the main areas you'd want to cover in the employee handbook. Um, general harassment would be harassment that's based upon a person's protected char characteristic. Uh, getting back to that discrimination, page, it could be race, it could be nationality, it could be age. That would be the general harassment. And it's any type of unwelcome ver verbal or physical conduct. So this is something you would want to have a policy in your handbook to let your employees know this is not acceptable. This is not what we are, are as a company. And it should not, employees should not be uh, participating in any type of um, harassment based on a person's protected characteristic. Uh, one of the more common areas you hear about, just because it is often out in the news, um, is the sexual harassment. And again, this policy, it should be in your handbook, it should be very descriptive, and it should be defining what is considered sexual harassment. And sexual harassment, it really is any type of um, unwelcome sexual advance or request for sexual favor. It could be verbal or physical conduct, and it's something that affects the employee's job whether it affects their ability to get a promotion, uh, to advance, to move in the in around in the position. It could also just affect them on their work performance. Um, the conduct is, is, could affect them and interfere with their work performance. And then it also creates just an intimidating and a hostile work environment, an offensive work environment. So those are the key things on the sexual harassment that should be in the policy. One note on the um, sexual harassment is that effective September 1st in the state of Texas, the employers that have at least one or more employees um, now need to comply with all of the sexual harassment um, training guidelines, et cetera, and have this policy in their handbooks and they should have it available to employees. Uh, what the, the state has said is now that managers, supervisors, and others who work in the interest of the business may be held individually liable. And so that's something really to take under, into consideration. Really, you know, with any type of business at any level now, you should have that training for not only yourself, but for your employees about what, what does constitute sexual harassment. And since this law is so new, uh, we don't know how some of the issues are go going to play out, but common thought is that we'll see more claims in regards to sexual harassment in the state of Texas. Uh, bullying is another type of harassment. And we see that a lot if it's just persistent, inappropriate behavior, it's malicious, it's something that's intimidating, it's an employee intimidating another um, employee or just verbal um, abuse, physical, hopefully not physical, but that could happen. And, and so, it is just in general uh, bullying and you want to make sure you have this policy in your handbook to make sure that your employees know this is not acceptable uh, within the workplace. Uh, another item in the handbook you would want and then as well as how you would act out upon uh, receiving any type of complaint is in the handbook you want to explain how you would handle any of the complaints that come across for discrimination and harassment. Um, as a manager or business owner, you want to make sure you're listening to that employee's complaint and act quickly to investigate the incident. Uh, you want to make sure that you're documenting the findings so that you have the notes 
and then taking any corrective action if needed. Uh, one of the key things is to follow up with the employee, let them know that you are researching or you are investigating that complaint and you take it seriously. Uh, by, by as a business owner or a manager taking those steps and showing the employee that they are taking that seriously, it may prevent them from going to an attorney and then getting some type of uh, lawsuit against you. And then also you may need to obtain guidance from a professional, whether it be a human resource professional or an attorney. Okay, jumping over to another item that should be in your handbook uh, would be the performance, the performance reviews. And you might discuss this, you, you don't need to go into it in too much detail, but it is something that um, employees would be looking for and it helps you in regards to some type of um, disciplinary action if that employee is not performing their position well. So performance feedback, typically you're going to see companies say, well, we do an annual performance review, um, which is great. There, a lot of times they're doing that and it's more documentation. Is it really the, the best way to do it? Um, Maybe, maybe not, but I think personally, you know, feedback throughout the year is the best. Provide that employee the feedback throughout the year on, on how well are they doing that position? What, what are they excelling in? Uh, what can they improve in? And are there some areas that you can offer additional training, um, you know, for them so that they can do better in their position? If you get into a situation where this employee is just not performing the position and they are not um, able to either do the position or it just is where they need improvement, then you need to discuss that as soon as the position, I mean, as soon as that you notice that there may be some issues. Um, discuss the performance uh, with that employee and tell them what your expectations are and how can you help them improve. And then offer any additional resources. You need to have that documentation um, of those discussions, whether it be you know starting off typically with verbal counseling, a verbal warning, and then maybe the last step would be a written warning with a performance improvement plan on what you expect for that employee. Uh, you want to have that documentation uh, for a couple of reasons to show that you did try your best in helping that employee, but also if, the if that employee files for unemployment, then the unemployment agency would ask you to provide that documentation. A uh, couple notes on workplace safety. Uh, because unfortunately this has become a, a bigger issue uh, that we've seen in the last few years, it is something you need to consider as a business owner and manager about discussions on workplace safety. Uh, it could be you know, workplace violence, it could be any act of intimidation, harassment, that gets back a little bit to the harassment that we talked about earlier. Um, but it also could affect you know, employees, clients, customers, or visitors. You want your employees to feel safe in the workplace. And by doing so, some of the suggestions that we have are to keep updated emergency contact information for all your employees so that you would know how to contact, who to contact if something came up. Um, we recommend you need to know who's in your workplace. If you have visitors and clients coming in and out all day, you know, you need to keep a visitor log to know who's, you know, coming back past the receptionist um, office, have them log in so, so that you know who's there. This to me would be particularly important, for example, like in a children's gym situation uh, or anything involving children, you want to know what parents or who's in that, um, in that area, maybe watching their children practice gymnastics, etc. So keep a log of that. Um, also keep first aid kits available and know the floor plan of the workplace and where the exits are located. We recommend having an emergency action plan and making sure your employees know what to do. Make sure they know the escape routes. I know it could be some difficult conversations um, to talk about, but it is something that you want to be prepared for. And actually many of the police departments have training on this as well, which is a really good resource. Um, we always want employees to be aware of the surroundings and to let, let you as a manager, business owner know if they see anything suspicious or hear any comments, they need to take those seriously. And then the last step would be on exiting employees, whether uh, you're terminating an employment relationship or the employee is leaving. Uh, the best way to handle any exit is to be respectful, treat that employee with respect. 
That is the key, um, just because it could prevent so many different issues down the road and they, they feel like they left on good terms. Um, and then have a standard exit process. Make sure the employee knows what to expect, what they're going to receive on their final paycheck, how that's gonna be calculated. Um, is there any benefits? How, you know, how will those be handled? And make sure if they have office keys, uh, make sure you're getting all of that back. You wanna make sure that they don't you know, go off and have your office key. Uh, so these are just things that to have is, would, would be a recommendation to have a checklist in regards to an exiting employee. And then just some final thoughts on um, what you should do as a business owner or manager. Uh, one thing just to kind of shed some light on how much litigation is, it, it is costly to small business owners. Um, if an employee goes and files a claim with the EEOC and it could be discrimination, career harassment, sexual harassment, it takes a lot of time and money and business owners spend a lot of time dealing with that. It also is emotional hardship. It really is, it, it's draining. It could really, um, again, take some time and going back and investigating and talking with employees. Um, and the cost of litigation can be expensive. It could run anywhere from 50,000, I mean, 5,000 to 150. Uh, usually you have to get an attorney involved and uh, the average cost could run about 10,000. Uh, some things that you can do as a business owner is to, to prevent employees from filing any type of claims and just to create that good environment is to treat all employees with respect. Uh, again, listen to the employees' concerns. Make sure that they feel like they're being heard. Um, establish procedures for employees to express concerns and make sure that you're following those procedures. Make sure that you're not deviating from one procedure to another. Um, by employee, because if that goes towards a jury, they're gonna say, why, why did you not follow that established procedure? And then investigate concerns and follow up with the employee. Make sure that they know that you did handle that situation. Uh, they don't have to know all the details, but let them know that you, you know, the situation has been taken care of. Document your conversations and do not retaliate. Uh, don't retaliate against the employee. Make sure others in the workplace don't retaliate against an employee for expressing a concern. Um, more along the lines of the documentation you need is just make sure you have those required documents that we mentioned earlier and have that employee handbook. Ensure your employment documents are in compliance, uh, that they are up to date. And then depending on the business size, there are employment law posters that need to be displayed and those are a requirement. So you want to make sure you have those. Uh, provide training. Again, it could be the sexual harassment training, it could be discrimination uh, training, but there are great resources in regards to training that can be provided. And then get it right from the start. And what we're saying there is start at that ground level and really build upon that. Because if you have the right documents in place, the right policies and procedures, it's gonna be easier for you to grow your business knowing that you already have the HR processes in place. And some resources that we would recommend that are really good um, is one is the Society for Human Resource Management. And you don't have to be a member to get some information. It is a great resource. Uh, some, some of the information is required to be a member, but others it is not. Uh, the TWC for Texas has some great information online for businesses, as well as um, almost an employer handbook, if you will, to tell you how to handle different situations. Uh, the IRS government is a great site. Uh, again, it has some information, small businesses, starting up your business, what you need to do and some policies you should have in place. Uh, the Department of Labor has some great information. And then feel free to always reach out to us, uh, Wendy and myself. Uh, we would be glad to answer any questions that you may have and be glad to um, provide resources if needed, or even contacts if you need um, contacts for training or benefits, et cetera. So um, we really do appreciate your time this morning and hope that it's provided some information as you continue to grow your business, or even thinking about hiring that first employee. Uh, I know that that's always exciting, but there are some things to think about on the HR side to just get in place so that you have everything there uh, that is set up to begin a successful relationship. So we really appreciate your time. Thank you.
That was such great information. A lot of it too. <laughs> so there's really more, it seems, that entrepreneurs need to know when they are going to start hiring. Donna Lisa, do you have some questions? So I do. So the first one, Lisa, um, I know you talked a little bit about interns, but you talked about paid interns. So what do you do? Because I know a lot of businesses will have the unpaid interns. Um, what are our role and responsibilities as employers to an unpaid intern? Typically, an unpaid intern, if you're if you have an unpaid intern, they need to be receiving credit uh, for maybe a college class and get some qualifications from a professor or something that it's part of their learning experience that they would be unpaid uh, to qualify. The IRS does have certain guidelines uh, to determine if it's paid or unpaid. Um, so that is an area definitely, you know, to be careful of, to make sure you're meeting the guidelines of an unpaid intern, because uh, the IRS is definitely wanting you probably to pay that intern uh, for their work. But there is some type of education requirements to make sure that that internship would be falling into an unpaid category. Okay. Um, so we know like a lot of times as, on, as solopreneurs and we're just kind of stepping in, maybe we've got a, you know, a business where our family comes in to help. Um, you know, what are the guidelines kind of on that? Because I mean, you know, I've seen uh, family situations turn really sour really fast, right? Yeah, that, that could be a tough one. Um, and you're right. As, as you're starting a business, you may have your family involved. And I guess my recommendation is to have, um, you know, some type of agreement or understanding. It, it depends, you know, if you're the business owner and you are bringing somebody in to help, you might need to consider them, that family member, you know, as a paid employee. Um, but you need to, you know, have an agreement. I would recommend some type of agreement in place so that you would know. Um, if, if they are part owner or part business owner, that may be a different type of situation. But if they are coming in to help, then there, there should be some type of written agreement. And I think it probably would fall under the category of employee that you may need to be paying them something there. Okay, great. Um, so what if an employee uh, says derogatory um, things on their social media about your business? What kind of recourse... <laughs> as an employer, do you have? Well, that, that's a tough one too. It seems like everything's tough in HR now um, <laughs> because you know they do have some type of um, freedom of speech. That's where it kind of conflicts. But then yet, if they're talking about your business, it really does depend on what they're saying. There are certain things that somebody can say on social media, such as maybe you know something about wages uh, that they are protected and they can say that, but there are depending, you know, on other things that they're saying, um, you know, I've seen recently, even where companies have been able to uh, fire an employee because they did put something out there in a belief that tied in with the business that didn't agree. And so they were able to fire that employee because of that. But there are certain things that an employee can put on social media and they're protected under certain laws. So if, you know, that does happen, then I would recommend you know, talking with an HR professional or an attorney if you're getting to that stage where you want to discipline them or consider firing them. Is that, is it, would it be something that you would also address inside of your employee handbook? Yes, that's, that's good. Um, good comment. Within, a, within your handbook, you should have a social media policy. Okay. Um, and that is becoming more important. You would want that social media policy to explain what you think is appropriate on social media and how you'd handle anything um, out there that's derogatory towards the company, employees, et cetera. Okay. Um, what are some important things to include when you're documenting a conversation with an employee? Uh, the main thing is, you know, to include as you document it, if it and I'm assuming it's performance related, uh, would be, you know, what, what is the situation? Give an example of what the employee is not doing. Uh, that always helps and talk to the employee and let them know, you know, this is an example of where I see you not performing. So provide that example, um, document it, you know, and that you've talked with the employee, uh, that this is what your expectations are, this is what they need to improve in. Yeah, you need to see improvement. For example, maybe it's just computer skills. You, they need to improve their Excel computer skills, um, for example. And then offer, you know, 
we've offered to you know send them to an Excel class. Um, so document what you're doing to help that employee. That always is a good sign if you're providing some type of assistance or training. And then if you're getting to that written um, conversation, a performance improvement plan, have the employee sign off that they understand that. And typically in that, you're, if you're at that last stage, you're going to say, you know, we need to see immediate improvement or this could be grounds for termination or other disciplinary action and have the employee sign off on it. Um, if employees don't sign off on it, then make a note, just say, you know, this was given to the employee, we had this conversation and the employee did not sign off. Um, that way you have that documentation for your file. Um, at, what, at what business stage um, do you need to begin to offer the FMLA? Um, business stage for that is more than 50 employees within a um, 75 mile radius. So pretty good size. Yeah, yeah, pretty big. Um, I had a, I just had another question. It just went right out of my head. It must be a senior moment. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, does any, do we have any other questions? I know we've got, oh, I know what it was. So I know we have a lot of people that are just, um, you know, the, maybe they're in the beginning stages or if they're in that place of kind of starting to think about employees, like what is the um, one, one or two things that they should start thinking about or putting into action? to bring on an employee? Um, I, I think the main things that and somebody just thinking about hiring an employee is to really you know, think about the job description, make sure you have a good dis job description. And, and I think also with a small employer, that could be very fluid at times too, because it's a wear all hats type of situation in, in a lot of times. But try to you know, define that job description and what you're really looking for. And then have those basic forms in place. Uh, you need to have at least, um, you know, the the required form, such as you know the W two, um, the I nine, but also you know have that offer letter, have some of the basic applications, uh, confidentiality agreement if needed, and then like I say, you may not need a full blown handbook, but think about what you want your policies to be, um, and then I'm sure as a new employee they're going to be asking, you know, do I get time off? So you probably want to think about some of those type of policies. Um, like that. So that would be in, in a small, like I say, maybe it's an abbreviated version of a full-blown employee handbook. Okay. And Lisa, can you help, can you kind of explain the whole at-will state for us? Um, yes, at Texas, um, like I said, it, with Texas, it is an at-will state, which means that an employee, uh, you can terminate an employee at any time for any reason. Uh, that doesn't mean that an employee cannot go to the EOC or sue you or file a, a claim against you but you can let them go or fire them for any reason. And then an employee can leave for any reason, which obviously is more typical. It really falls back on the employer that they can, they can um, let go an employee. They may not have to do the written steps that we suggest like the performance write-ups. Uh, they could fire an employee at any time for any reason, but you also still are at risk that that employee can go and file some type of EOC suit against you. That doesn't prevent that. Okay. Um, Joanne asks, are we able to put in writing that bad attitude is not acceptable or that it is that not legal? Um, you, it, it's hard to define. Bad attitude, attitude in general is hard to define. And I would recommend probably explaining, you know, what is that bad attitude? Is it yelling at the customers? Is it how you interact with other employees? Try to define that bad attitude. And that would be much better because I think attitude is, you know, it could be so broad and it could be varied off of different opinions. Whereas if you can really bring it down to define what, what is, why is that person have bad attitude, that's going to be much better when uh, you have that discussion. Yeah, I get it. Totally. Um, Samantha asks, how would a seasonal or as needed employee work um, come under? I think that's back with the temporary and exempt, non-exempt. Yeah. It was like a, a seasonal employee. Yeah, a seasonal or someone that maybe, um, I know she does heavenly tailored suites. So maybe she has somebody come in, she's got a big order and she has somebody come in to help her. So kind of on an okay. as needed basis. Okay, uh, and that may be a situation that you do bring them on as a temporary employee. Um, if, you, if you know somebody or you hire them yourself, then they would just be a temporary employee and under your uh, payroll. 
And last question from Shay. She wanted to know what are essential standards or topics that should be addressed in an HR handbook? Um, well, besides the ones that, you know, we talked about with the, the main policies, you might also have, you know, there's so, there, <laughs> there's so many right now, um, you know, because when I immediately comes to mind, you know, you want to have, you know, what about bringing weapons into the workplace? Um, smoking policy, you have a smoking policy. Do you have um, um, a discrim I mean, a disability policy, how you would handle employees or candidates with disabilities? Uh, what is your time off policies? Uh, what, how, how would you uh, handle time off in certain situations or if somebody's out on a long-term leave or they have to go out for jury duty? Think about all those type of time off bereavement, all of those type of time off policies. Uh, what you expect in the workplace, what, you know, how do you expect your employees to interact? Um, you don't want them to be yelling or screaming, you know, <laughs> at each other. I've had that put in a handbook. Do not curse in the hand, in the employment, you know, employee. I mean, at the employee workplace, you know, um, no loud screaming, um, dress code. Is there a certain dress code that you want to provide on that? Um, and so just a really, you know, kind of the whole um, policy procedures that you're thinking about for your workplace. And and I will say that the, the Texas workforce has a great um, information. They have a Texas employer book that has a lot about different policies you might want to consider in your handbook and then we also would be glad to you know provide some general like ideas about what you know you might want to think about in the handbook as well like a general table of contents all right i'm so shocked that we did not get a covid question <laughs> it changes we're, daily <laughs> we're, maybe we're just all covid fatigued i know <laughs> yeah. well thank you so much lisa and wendy we appreciate it i know that um a lot of times i, I think hr is one of those things that um, we kind of think about, and but we kind of keep it in the back of our head. It's something we, you know, as a small, as an entrepreneur or small business owner, we're kind of hesitant to lean into. Um, but I think all of this was really great information. Um, so I will hand it over to Tracy. Thank you. Ladies, thank you so much. That was great and so much information. Uh, so uh, we did record the video, so people need to go back and, and, and review it. But thank you for bringing so much to light that we don't always think about. Uh, Wendy, I'm sorry you got a little staticky there, hopefully. <laughs> Everything's okay. Thank you guys so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And for everyone that has joined, we are going to have some networking. Uh, after this, but I'm going to turn it back to Donna Lisa then for the networking and to tell you what our upcoming events are. Yep. So next um, Thursday, September the 23rd, we have our quarterly special evening event, the Entrepreneur's Mental Health Makeover with Carrie Breedlove from Breedlove Counseling. On September 24th, um, we're, Tracy's actually going to be doing a Facebook uh, it will be on LinkedIn and YouTube as well, an information session about our Start Her Grant. So um, Tracy, did you want to talk about that really quick about our Start Her Grant? Oh, sure. We have pre-announced our Start Her Grant this year. We are giving away, I'm so excited, 25 uh, $5,000 grants to um, ideation or new businesses or early businesses. So uh, we just wanna make sure that everybody does a uh, complete application. So we are going to have the Facebook or the live event. And then Donna Lisa is also posting tips on our social media about how to complete a grant application. So uh, we'd love to have you join us live. Uh, the information is on our website. Donna Lisa just put that in there. And always read, 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 uh, read the guidelines, read the FAQs, and do not send a question after you've submitted <laughs> or a question that should have been on there. If you have a question, ask before you submit your application because it may be something that if uh, you didn't complete uh, would get you disqualified and we don't wanna see that happen to anybody. So uh, again, we're really excited about this. The application will actually open on the 22nd, but we pre-announced so we can help everybody get ready and turn in a great application. 
Yes, and then um, so we will have a Facebook Live on the 24th with um, you, you can jump on and Tracy will answer your questions live or we'll go through um, and talk about some of the FAQs. Then on October 12th, Women Rise is Experiential Marketing 101. It's brand building through engagement. This is a new topic. Um, and we've got Cassandra Greenfield coming in. Registration opens in one, well, is open now. Um, and then October 23rd is our next Saturday workshop and it's going to be social media related. Um, and we will have more details about that coming soon. And then lastly, um, I do have a poll I would like to launch really quick. Um, if we could take a few minutes to answer that, that would be fabulous. And then once we're done with that, we will uh, break out into our networking. Can they, can you see the poll? Okay. And Lisa and Wendy, you're more than welcome to jump into the networking as well. I'm sure there are other questions Thank too you. people will think of after <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> and we'd be glad to help. <laughs> Thank you. We'll just give it a couple more seconds here. Thank you for taking the time to fill it out. We appreciate that. All right, we'll go ahead and end. All right, let me pull us off of Facebook real quick and quit recording.